Jacob, thank you very much for joining me on the show, man. I really appreciate you doing this in these uh, in these hard times. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on. No, it's awesome. We gotta um, keep ourselves busy, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I was up till kind of two o'clock this morning, kind of talking to Andrew Locke, physiotherapist over in Australia. So it's wicked that I get to then come and talk to you today because I get all of these different opinions. It is brilliant. I'm really, really enjoying it so far. So I'm interested to talk to you because you have done so much work in kind of the injury prevention field, looking at how we can kind of better ourselves to make sure that we are better ready for for physical activity and returning to physical activity and health. So I'm interested to kick off with kind of the the biggest question that there is. How much time, and it's a big question, how much time do you feel we should be putting into injury prevention with both kind of gen pop and also the trained generation? What do we need to be looking at? How much time do we do you think that we need to be giving to this? Yes, it's a bit of a loaded question because it has to go into what is it that we're doing to actually try and reduce our risk of injury in the first place, right? Like, what is that? I think a lot of people have this notion that injury prevention, and let's just put it out up front that we don't prevent all injury, you know, even if we use the term, um, we're just talking about reducing risk, right? A lot of people have the notion that it's some sort of special exercise or special technique or special routine. Like it's, it's nothing se- separate from your own normal full training at the end of the day. So if, when we think about like how much time should we dedicate to it, I don't know that you necessarily, necessarily need to dedicate any time, time where that is 100% specifically the goal. The dedication there should come more so or so in thinking about how are you setting up that training program? How are you, what is the baseline level of activity that you are currently prepared for so, far so that you can then build off of that without over, overdoing it? Um, manage Fatigue management and kind of understanding how your body's feeling, auto-regulation, all those things, those things are going to fit into kind of overarching principle. Um, so the time that you would dedicate to that in your even if you weren't thinking about it from an injury prevention perspective is the time that you should dedicate to it if you were thinking about it from an injury prevention perspective yes most definitely so uh, i think it's it's very interesting because of course when you you get the the trained populace and the kind of gen pop obviously with people that are playing sports and stuff that these things have found their way kind of into their lifestyles a little bit more you know when you're playing in in, in these sports teams etc uh, or even if you've been in a gym for a long time, you definitely have this understanding of, you know, the time that you should be spending on developing the, the smaller things, you know, not just working these big mechanical structures, but working everything else around it, warming it up and getting ready for it. So I think naturally for the trained populace, it almost becomes part, a little bit more of their lifestyle. You know, these are things that maybe a little bit more conscious attention is being brought to just proprioceptively. You know, you know how your body feels because yeah. you've had that training, you've got that adaptation. But with the untrained population, I think this is where it's very, very difficult because for them, they don't have that sense of, you know, they they can't feel it kinesthetically. They can't feel what's off and what isn't, which is then when we obviously come across to to someone like yourself and we sit down with you and we kind of go, okay, well, what is wrong with my body, you know? And then it kind of gets put over to you to kind of fix um, all those different parts. But as part of the injury prevention thing, I think, you know, you put a brilliant post out on, on Instagram talking about that it is kind of, it's a puzzle. It's it's a problem-solving game. And that more times than not, it's never necessarily just one thing that is the issue. And I think this is the, the bigger complication yeah. that comes into a lot of injuries is that uh, an injury isn't necessarily something that we should just be focusing on that one thing to get better. But as a result, there is this chain of command, breakdown with different muscles, working more or less or being tighter or looser and it throwing us all out of sync. So how do you think we can kind of, we can create that foundation to come back when there are so many potentially different facets that are being kind of a contributing factor to that original injury well i use what i kind of call my low-hanging fruit model and it's like what is the most obvious thing that you feel you could do that would give you a large effect um and whenever you have a 
ton of different potential factors involved in say that you've been injured and now you want to figure out how to get back from that. Um, you ask yourself, you know, what's, what's my lowest hanging fruit? What's the easiest thing I could do that I feel would have a decent effect on a positive outcome. And so if you, for some people, like let's take kind of our, our gin pop untrained average everyday guy who doesn't really exercise is overly stressed, works long hours, yada, yada. Right. He comes in he's like, yeah, you know, I sleep about four hours a night. Um, and I have very high work stress and I don't really have an exercise routine. Well, I think those, that's three things that might be some low hanging fruit that you could address, right? Like, could we get your sleep even an hour up? Like that's probably going to help you. Uh, could we come up with some sort of stress management strategy for you? That's probably going to help you. And then just a basic exercise routine, right? Like doesn't even have to be, um, you know, it doesn't need to be a strength hypertrophy a sports performance focus like can you go for a walk are you getting your minimum exercise are you getting your minimum exercise guidelines 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise 75 minutes a week of uh, per week of vigorous exercise you know that's low hanging fruit when you talk to that person now you translate that over to the trained population and you take somebody who is like, their nutrition's pretty well on point, their recovery is pretty well on point, their sleep's pretty well on point, they manage their stress very well, you know, um, even their like their training technique is really, really good. Um, for that person in, you know, what you might need to do there is just establish some sort of baseline that they can work then off of and say, all right, let's just gradually, progressively load and try and figure out, you know, What's that next step forward? So here's a movement that's bothering you. Let's scale that down and then scale it back forward from there. Um, I see more of the trained population um, in my clinic. So like that's who I'm working with more and that's more the approach that we take. But, you know, when the other side comes in too, you just kind of start to ask yourself, all right, what's the, what's the obvious thing I feel like I can work on that's going to give me a decent effect? Yes, 100%. And I think when you're working in a trained environment, it obviously brings across many different complications. The kind of gen pop guys, you know, they're not necessarily going to be pushing their bodies to the same limits. They're not going to have the same focus. They're not going to have the same drive, the same obsession, the same willingness to do the same things to put in what it takes to get out what they want. But on the flip yeah. side, you then also have that trained population. And I know because I trained with them for many years. I'm one of the most impatient human beings on the planet, but I have understood through many injuries to become patient. So I'm interested to throw it over to you. You probably see it in your clinic a lot. A lot of these guys that are just so hungry and they want to get back so quickly. They just, they, they feel that need to get back into where they were through this injury. Do you feel like we're, we're, ever doing too much or too little when it comes to kind of uh, coming back from injury. And the reason I say that is, you know, you look at, and I'm going to throw the extremes out there, but like the guys over at West Side where, you know, they've got torn off biceps and they're still deadlifting, they're pushing it through and they're getting their body to, to kind of do whatever they need to do regardless. And then also on the other side of things, you kind of have the people that are pussyfooting around it that aren't necessarily putting in as much as they should do because maybe you know, psychologically, they believe they have more pain than they do, or they're worried, they're anxious. So how do you manage, A, the, the, the people that are super, super hungry, that just want to go, you know, until the wheels fall off and, and do too much in their, in their rehab, prehab? And then how do you flip it from the opposite end of the spectrum with these people that are far too scared to, to kind of do more damage? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, a good, really good point there because we do see different, different people, different, um, personality profiles that with that play into this. Um, and everybody has their own challenges, you know, and something that's, I see, I talk about a lot is the, um, a lot of like my untrained people who don't exercise type of group the, you know, one of their biggest challenges is, is adherence. But it's adherence because, like, it's trying to get them to do the exercises. Um, on the other end, though, with a lot of, like, my athletes, the they have an adherence problem, too. It's you need to make it worth me changing my clothes. 
Like if it's it's not actually challenging enough for me to go do this, it's boring. So I'm going to go jump in and do something I probably sh shouldn't be doing <laughs> because I can't bring my mind to just do this kind of what is muscularly not that challenging, um, at least early on. So to circle back around there to how do we manage these different personality traits, um, it starts with identifying how much of a restriction, how much protection should we put on this person? Um, so in the healthcare world, we kind of have this protect versus expose debate that is ever ongoing. How much do you protect? So how much do you take stress and load off of something that might be healing versus how much do you need to expose that person and allow them to push into things a bit more? And so with a lot of injuries, um, a grand majority of injuries and pain, pain does not necessarily reflect the state of a tissue. Pain reflects the sensitivity of the system as a whole. And we see this a lot when you look at, say, MRI findings in, say, an asymptomatic population. So no symptoms. We see very similar MRI findings to those who do have symptoms. Um, you might see rotator cuff tears in a shoulder that has no pain or disc herniations in a low back that has no pain, um, meniscus tears in a knee that has no pain. And so we then have to question, well, is that something that if we see that on a picture, do we need to protect that person? You know, do we need to not stress that area or can we expose it, but expose it in a more tolerable way? Um, yeah, you know, if somebody comes in with a freshly torn ACL, you probably want to protect, right? Like, let's stay off that or like what you were saying torn bicep if somebody has just freshly torn their bicep maybe i i personally would not be having them deadlift in the first week right like i wouldn't <laughs> be doing that funnily enough <laughs> it, but i'm gonna i'm gonna protect more in that, in that case because there is some acute t tissue damage there that we want to heal and we want to make sure that we're not you know hindering that process now on the other end and somebody comes in and they have chronic low back pain that, you know, set in, it's been going on for three years on and off. Most of the tissue stuff there is probably pretty healed up. It's probably not something that we have to say, like, you can't deadlift in that case. But we do need to find a tolerable baseline that doesn't increase your symptoms to a large degree. And so with that side of things, we try to say, well, you've, it's okay for you to feel some pain during the exercise, but maybe, you, but we don't want you to feel worse coming out of the exercise. And so it starts with that. It starts with identifying, should I be protecting this? Should I, should I be exposing this? And, and what's interesting with the two extremes you gave there was you gave one extreme where we should be protecting, but we don't. And you gave another extreme where we should be exposing, but we don't. And <laughs> so with the extreme of like, I need to protect this area, in, AKA like I just tore my bicep and I shouldn't be deadlifting, but I want to deadlift because I'm afraid of losing my gains, right? Like there's very common to the underlying very reason common. why, right. That we have to get to the underlying re reason why they don't want, why they want to, you know, continue to train. And, um, so get to that. Then, Part of my job as a rehab professional is how do I find something else that you can do to maintain the stimulus on your body, maintain the training stimulus, and keep your fitness level intact without um, hindering what we need to do for this localized area that's been injured. So if we have somebody who can't train their posterior, um, can't train their posterior chain super heavy because they can't, or they can't do the deadlift super heavy because of this bicep. You know, could we put them onto a glute ham raise or a 45 degree back extension and have them, you know, repping out a lot of high intensity work there? Um, you know, could we put them on a belt squat and or a pit shark and have them working the quads in that case because they can't hold the barbell on their back, you know, and they can't do a front squat or anything like that because of that bicep, right? We had to find ways to try and take the arm out of it a little bit. Um, likewise, less something that I think m maybe more of us probably deal with, um, than a torn bicep. Let's say that you're just getting some, like some 
distal bicep tendinopathy. So you're getting like pain in your elbow, pain in the front of the elbow there anytime you do a curl. You know, we may not want to push, push, push you to like, oh man, I'm going to lose all my bicep gains with that because then they just keep pushing into symptoms that keep making you worse and worse and worse because you can't tolerate that load yet. But on the flip side, you know, you normally curl the 30, 35 pound dumbbells and right now you get pain at anything over 15. You know, you get to you get to the 20 pound dumbbell, it's like, ooh, there's that that pain and like you could knock out 20 pounds for 25 30 reps. You're like yeah, you need to do the 15s, but is it worth your time? Well, and in that case, maybe we'd like throw a BFR strap on you, you know, to do some occlusion training or something, help you maintain that stimulus, but do it at the 15 pound dumbbell so that we're kind of living in both worlds here and getting the best of both. Well, I love that you said that because it's, um, it's that crossover of, you know, it's keeping the athlete who feels like they have to have some kind of tension. They have to have some kind of stimuli to be moving forward with whatever it is they choose to do because... I mean, I know hundreds of people that like that. That's just they feel like they need to constantly be moving forward, otherwise they're moving backwards. So it's fantastic that you say something like that, where you're like, "Okay, we we, we know that what you're doing isn't necessarily right, and you're gonna you're try you're trying to keep on train that thing that we know we need to work on, but to allow the athlete to continue to do that, but then take." that overstimulus away by, like you said, kind of using that occlusion training or finding different methods of accommodative resistance or something that's going to allow us to work with less overall load but allow the body to get used to more accommodative load, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is where it's so important for a tra trainee to understand the underlying mechanism for how you get the adaptation that you actually want to get. You know, like... So for if you think that you can only get that you can only build muscle with heavy weights at eight reps or less, right? Then you're going to have a hard time moving forward whenever you can't do reps of eight reps or less because you can't handle that load. But when you understand that the mechanism is mechanical tension and get and getting to a relatively close proximity to failure and that we could build muscle with reps anywhere from 5 to 30, as long as we get pretty close to failure, um, then things like occlusion training make more sense. Slowing a tempo down makes more sense. Doing some higher rep work makes more sense. And we can say, hey, no, do this weight that you can actually tolerate, because your symptoms, we can't keep pushing you into higher, higher sensitivity state, because our goal, our ultimate goal is – get you tolerating the level of load that you need to be able to tolerate to live life the way you want to live it, right? Without provoking a symptom. Because if you think about training, what it is, is it is a limitation primarily by effort with, a, with low symptoms, right? It's not limited by pain, it's limited by effort. Whenever you are in an injured state, you're often limited by pain, effort kind of stays low. What we want to do is we want to reestablish that balance and say eventually we want to work you to a point that effort is your primary limiting factor symptoms no longer are once you do that once you do that pain is no longer really the problem anymore and are you really injured at that point because you're kind of living life functionally the way you want to live it um so again kind of understand the adaptation that you're after and then understand all the various ways you might get there um to flip that over to the other side of that spectrum where we had somebody who was kind of acutely fearful of pushing where maybe they needed to push. So this goes into a bit of – we call that fear avoidance. And there's a model around – it's called the fear avoidance model where somebody can feel pain and you kind of have two responses. Either you have very low fear around that, basically like – okay, it's pain, um, it's not the worst thing in the world, all right, I'll live with it, right, all right, I'll deal with it. Maybe you take the approach of, yeah, you know what, backing off for a couple of weeks is probably a good thing, but because you have very low fear around that, you eventually confront the thing that is bothering you, and so you gradually re-expose yourself to it. That tends to lead to a, a favorable outcome. You tend to just, a lot of 
people will just naturally work their way back into their training after taking a little time off, um, which is great. That's what we want. But on the other side, somebody might have more of a high fear response. And because of that, they go into more of a prolonged avoidance of stressing that area. So this might be somebody who, who gets fearful of bending down and picking something up off the floor. So they you know, start to avoid any flexion movements. They start to avoid any lifting movements. And that actually might, they might actually get a positive reinforcement by the fact that you don't stress something, it tends to feel better. Go right? figure. Like if you, <laughs> right, yeah, right? Like if it hurts me to do bicep curls and I don't do bicep curls so it doesn't hurt, like the, the response might be, oh, well, bicep curls were bad for me, so therefore I shouldn't do bicep curls, right? Which obviously is now, the case. <laughs> short term. <laughs> yeah, so short term, that's actually that could actually be useful, right? Because you aren't you you are not in this other extreme where you just won't stop. Um, but what do we know happens if you don't stress something for a long time? Well, it gets weaker, right? Or it gets deconditioned. So now it's going to be more easy for you to overload that area again. And the longer you decondition that, the easier it's going to be to overload it again. And you kind of end in this circle, this cyclical pattern where maybe it used to hurt you to do a deadlift for eight at an RP eight, you know, and you got kind of fearful of that. And then you came maybe you, at some, you know, three months later, you're like, all right, you know, I'm going to try that deadlift again. But then you like flared up at, you know, you know, 50 pounds less than where you flared up before. And you're like, Ooh, okay. Well, I guess I shouldn't do deadlift still. And then you can stop. And then eventually it's hurting you just to pick up and do daily random tasks around the house and stuff. So again, protect versus expose. A lot of these people we need to be exposing more, but how this comes in is not necessarily trying to find a physical adaptation up front but more so managing it from the psychological standpoint of, of what do you feel comfortable doing? Because if you become acutely fearful and guarded at, say, deadlifting 150 pounds, but you feel okay around 135, well, let's just work at 135 for right now. It might be easy. It might not give you any physical adaptation whatsoever, but if it has the effect of reducing the fear so that you can then do 150 the next time I see you in a month, a month from now, that is still progress. It's just progress by a different mechanism. So with that, it's start where you are comfortable starting and then, you know, kind of learn through experience that you're going to be okay. And if something I'll ask people here is I'll just ask the question how many reps would you need to do with this weight to feel comfortable adding five pounds? You know, and I'll, I'll kind of give some examples. Like, do you think if you could do 12 reps with this dead on this deadlift that you could add five pounds and get three of them? Like, you think adding five pounds is going to flare you up? You know, do you think that's going to ma ma magically take you zero to 60 in symptoms? And most people are pretty logical. Like, of course not. Of course that's not going to happen. I'm like, okay cool, then let's do that, right? Like, but now they've verbalized it. Now they've said it. And it really becomes about build. It's a confidence. Like you're progressing through confidence and the rehab is about reestablishing the confidence in your body and reducing the fear in those cases so that you can expose. And then on the back end, once the fear has reduced, then we can focus more on physical adaptations and reducing some of that deconditioning that has happened over time. Yeah, and actually getting the body back to, to doing what it should be doing and feeling how it should be. I think, you know, for anyone that's had an extensive injury for a long period of time, obviously it, it changes things, you know, the way that you hold yourself, the way that you walk, the way you carry things, the way that you might perform your sport. So having that time to kind of just get your body moving again. And I think that that was an interesting topic that I spoke to Andrew Locke about, you know, that, you know, for, for a lot of us, it's a case of that, our bodies do tremendously well at recovering from things over like a four week period. So he's talking about kind of like a lot of spinal issues that he's seeing that if he, you know, even if he did prescribe the, the, the greatest exercise in the world, usually within a four week period, the pain symptoms tend to usually kind of dwindle away. So it's, it's very interesting to, to kind of hear you talk about that and, and have that kind of 
polar opposite kind of ideas of you know should we be getting back to it too soon are we getting back to it too late and again go, kind of going back to your instagram posts you kind of you know you you put a fantastic post out there to kind of say you know we don't necessarily need to be rushing back into these things because the body has still got this kind of like two three week window before we start getting into muscular breakdown and these weaknesses occur and that we shouldn't actually necessarily be scared to rest and i think that 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 is a fear for a lot of kind of the trained populace that that you probably deal with is that there is probably that inherent fear of oh man if i spend two or three weeks out of the gym then you know my performance this season is just going to be down the down the can so i think it's it's, it's very hard to manage and that i should be very and i want to be very clear i am not i'm not advocating complete rest i'm not advocating staying out of the gym I'm advocating what I call relative rest, which is scaling down to a tolerable level and continuing to work at that and continuing to stay active. Yes. And, you know, you know, but what I'm saying is not when you're, you know, in that, say, two to four week period there where you're scaled down and it might be longer, it might be shorter, whatever. Um, you need to let the symptoms be your guide a bit more rather than your effort now if you get effort out of it with lows with manageable symptoms awesome like keep at that like that's the you're doing fine but if your symptoms just won't allow you to work at a high effort realize that you don't have to work at a high effort level because that may not be the primary goal right now the primary goal needs to be getting these symptoms under control and again that doesn't mean stop it doesn't mean go and do bed rest or lay on your couch. It, there's nothing wrong with laying on your couch for a day or two to let things chill. But eventually we want to get back to it. We just want to get back, back to it in a tolerable manner and keep doing, keep doing what we're doing, but in a more of a scaled down version until we can scale our way back up to our normal training routine. Team. yeah i think it's fantastic that you bring on that point you know kind of like the sat on the couch or kind of you know lying down in bed often more than not i'm sure you'll probably find, find the same thing that actually if we become sedentary after these injuries it's more, more more than often the case that it's probably the worst thing that we can do because everything then seizes up we create all of these imbalances and actually the body isn't used to what it's do, what it's normally used to doing so by you know even you know having issues with knees or ankles or whatever obviously you know we talk about pain management and symptom management as long as that you can do it like you said even just going for a walk if you have a bad knee as long as it's not painful just doing that to keep it moving is going to be far better than kind of that traditional and i'm going to bring up the kind of rice concept now i i played rugby for many many years up to a very high standard and i was kind of indoctrinated into this kind of rest ice compression elevation this is what we should be doing for recovery this is what's going to help the body now again obviously we move kind of like 15 20 years down the line and i don't remember the name of the gentleman you'll have to excuse me i'm awful with names but obviously has gone back and said that ice isn't necessary you know we, the things that we thought were necessary then are necessary now so kind of t taking away from it looking at other tools so hot colds treatment actual rest compression all these things how much of them are still relevant into in today and kind of getting back uh out there to kind of do your training or whatever is any of this stuff necessary anymore do we need to be doing hot and cold treatments what really is is kind of the the updated version of our rice and what can we be using as almost like a cheat sheet to help us with, with our return back. Um, most of, the, I would say, the hot cold treatments and stuff like that are rest. Even are really seen nowadays as more symptom modification. So if it feels good to you, do it. If it doesn't make you immediately feel better, it's probably not going to have a wonderful effect. Um, you know, it's it's like what I say about foam rolling. It, it's um, it should have an immediate effect if you know it's not going to be the 10th session that magically all of a sudden makes it <laughs> makes it work um if it doesn't work for you the first time it's probably not going to work the 10th time you know and the like the similar things with say like ice and heat 
a lot of people ask me, oh, you know, should I put an ice pack on my back? Should I put a hot pack on my back? Like, just try both and see what feels better, you know? Or try neither of them because neither one of them are necessary for you to get better. Um, there's some different ac acronyms out there now that people are using. One's called, like, police. So, um, okay. and it, it integrates things like loading into that to elevation still in there. There's another one called like, peace and love, which I think is the most <laughs> recent one. Um, and so like we're adding letters and letters. Oh, and letters I was going to say, it's everything. just basically the full um, alphabet by the end of this, isn't it? Uh, it's going to have everything Yeah, yeah, the yeah, sun. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but really, you have to really think about it from how do we view in It's like, what is this updated view of injury in the first place? Which is, look at injury as primarily the limitation of function. That like the thing that drives you to be injured is primarily the disability that it creates. Um, to give you an example of that, I assume that everyone listening to this has had a paper cut at some point in their life. And it hurts like hell, right? But you would never go to the doctor for it. <laughs> you, you put a Band-Aid on it. Yeah, I mean, hopefully. <laughs> but you would put a Band-Aid on it and you would um go about your day you probably even go train that day you know and you know you've probably stubbed your toe at some point and it really hurt but like what would it take for you to go to the doctor for that it, it would probably have to be black and blue and you'd be unable to walk on it so that there's something there that's violated your expectation of what this should have been and you went and you know you're worried about it being a fracture you know and so you went to the doctor because you were worried about something. You didn't go to the doctor because it hurt, you know? And that, that's a very interesting thing to think about from an injury perspective, which is a lot of people will continue to work through pain and discomfort until it reaches a, a certain level of sensitivity that they can then no longer work through it. And that's when they tend to seek out help. It's not because it hurts. It's because it has removed something from their life that they want back. And when you start to view the, and when you start to view the rehab process as the restoration of what it is that it's taken from you, then you can get a, you have a much better guide towards how you move forward from that. Because if you just say, I need to be pain free, well, that might not be a realistic goal. That might, not, it, it really just might not be. And to put all of your eggs into the I want all my pain to be gone basket and my only outcome is if pain is gone, we succeeded. If pain is not gone, we have failed. You're going to have a tough time. So with that, start to view the rehab process as a restoration of function. And so you ask yourself, well, what am I limited in doing right now? What is it that I can't do that I want to be able to do? And you start to put your you're focusing to doing those things. But, and so if you can't, let's say you're dealing with a back injury and you can't squat, can you, maybe you can't squat, squat with a certain amount of weight. So you, so you work with lighter weight because there's a very clear picture of how you move forward back to heavier weight. If you can't squat with a bar, can you, can you just sit to a chair and stand back up? Cause at least you're doing the same motion, right? And then maybe could you hold a five pound dumbbell or a goblet squat and then work your way back from there. And you start to build this clear picture of here's the activity I want to be able to do. Here's my current baseline of what I can do. I need to figure out how to move from A to B. And moving from A to B does not necessarily mean that I need to have a zero out of 10 pain every single day or I have failed. You, you know, over time, yes, we want to see symptoms go down, but also we need to realize that no one walks around when in acute pain forever, right? Like we were just, like you were just mentioning, there's kind of a four to six week time frame there where a lot we see a large reduction in pain, even if we do nothing. So that's just natural history. So, you know, you're not going to deal with acute pain forever. And, but also like avoiding the thing that hurts forever probably isn't going to help you get it back either. You know, if you just avoid it forever and then just hope I come back three months later, it's like, 
you know, that's like playing the lottery, you know, you're just hoping versus like you've t put it in your own hands and say, I'm going to do that exercise that kind of hurts me or I'm going to do a scale, but I'm going to do it in a more scaled down manner and I'm going to continue to put in some work there and then I'm going to continue to work my, my way forward because then every single day and every, ex every increase in rep that you get, every increment of weight that you add, add is progress and that's objective progress that means that you're better than you were yesterday. Yeah, and I think I, I, as a personal trainer and I've spent many years in gyms is that I see this almost on a daily basis, especially with movements like uh, the deadlift or a squat. The deadlift is a personal favorite of mine. You know, we people come in and they'll kind of pull two or three plates and they'll go, oh man, my, my back's really starting to hurt now. I don't really feel like I can go anymore. So they'll do their three plates and then I'll kind of see them two weeks later and they'll go, okay, I'm deadlifting again. I'll go, okay, so have you kind of done anything? Since then, like no, 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 I, you know my back was hurting, so I just, I just, just left it. And they come back in, they load up three plates, and then those three plates is, is is a struggle, and it's kind of this reciprocating thing to a point of which they just go, oh well, I obviously can't deadlift any more than three plates. Like I'm just going to stop doing this. This is pointless. And it's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Like if you just you take that step back and you say, okay, well, there's obviously something larger at hand here, and then build back up from there then actually, you know, your your maximum is going to be much, 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 much higher than this. But we right. we tend to, at that first sight, just kind of go, oh, something's wrong. Like, I'm just going to sack that off and then hope, hopefully that'll get better in the background. And then lo and behold, it hasn't. And then we start that whole kind of negative cycle again. Yeah. And, you know, if you, <laughs> I mean, that, that's, uh, that screams programming issue, right? Like that just screams programming issue. If you're just loading up the same weight each week, week in, week out, just trying to do it, just trying to get, you know, a little bit more. And it's always a struggle for you. Um, maybe we should think about implementing some sort of periodization in that. Uh, you know, like that's the case for kind of a wave load and saying, you know, maybe we should take a period at instead of three plates, let's do 275 there. But, you know, go for six, go for six reps and then do 280, 285 and do that for five reps, you know, and then wave back down and then you do 280 for six. And then we're going to keep coming up until eventually, you know, you get back to that three, you get to those, that 315, that three plates. Eh, it's not the, actually nearly as big of a deal as it was prior. But the problem primarily is like you're coming in here and trying to move RP nine, nine and a half, 10, 10 loads week in and week out it's giving you a negative response then you spend the rest of the week backing away from everything it's had such a negative response so now you can't train yeah yeah everything's so, up. you can't do anything what do you think is going to happen work. right like yeah, you can't <laughs> yeah. do anything that's going to contribute and actually bring you back up to a better baseline so you're just basically spending your entire time just smashing your head against the brick wall and then wondering why this problem right. isn't getting any better I mean, look at it from, look at it, take pain out of the question and just look at it from a training perspective. And it's the exact same argument that you would see for leaving some reps in reserve. If you train to absolute failure and it trashes you, or say you, say you did 10, 15 sets to full on failure on Monday, it trashes you so bad that you then cannot train the rest of the week until the next Monday. It takes you the whole week to recover. Like if you just left a couple reps in reserve and did seven sets on Monday, could you do another seven sets with some reps in reserve on Wednesday and another seven sets on Friday? You actually did more total volume by doing less in one bout, right? To the point that it didn't trash you. If we're looking at the same thing here, we're just saying it has a symptom associated with it, which is, you're push you're banging your head against the wall with this weight that is at the limit of your load tolerance that it's giving you a negative response it's flaring you up up and to the point that it's taking you a week to recover from that and then you're going to come and try it again and it's going to take you a week to recover from that over and over and over again it's like if you would just go a little bit lighter with that then to the point that it doesn't trash you maybe you feel some symptoms and maybe you you know it can still be difficult but it's manageable sometimes. But it doesn't track. But it's manageable. And then maybe you could still train again on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, get a little more work in. You know, you weren't 
feeling you weren't waking up you know achy to the point that like you were you know feeling a little tender to walk around and you know bend down and put your shoes on the next day yeah that's probably a good idea would be to to work that way because you're going to get more out of doing less yes a hundred percent and i also i think it's, it's interesting to touch upon it as well because of course when you come back from injury you're always going to have that time where it's like okay you know we've been working on this we've been building it up there is always going to be that time where it's like okay we actually need to now test out this function again we actually now need to see you know where we're at what we can actually elicit from the body and and how is it actually going to cope so i think for a lot of people is that that you also have to understand that there is going to be that time where you are going to have maybe that slight bit of discomfort. And for someone that is a bit nervous and a bit scared is that, like yeah. you kind of said, handling those expectations of it's not a bad thing. You know, it, it we have to understand and we have to have a little bit better self-awareness so as to not overdo it. But, it, but by no stretch of the imagination is it a bad thing that we're getting just that little bit of pain because we're stimulating something that maybe needs to be stimulated a little bit more for us to kind of get that foundation back from it yeah and so i think you just need to put some rules in place with that you know it's like because i say it's okay for you to feel some discomfort but put some guidelines on yourself there yeah it's a scale so you know pain-free wonderful we love pain-free that would be great (laughs) right but if you're gonna feel some discomfort and you don't have to be afraid of feeling some discomfort um one guideline you could say is you just shouldn't feel worse after you do the set, meaning it, it should settle relatively quickly. Um, I go a little bit further than that, and I say like any symptoms that you feel should settle back to a relative baseline within one to two minutes of completing the set. So if you started at, say, a 3 out of 10, it built up to around a 5 before you finished the set up, it should settle back to a 3 out of 10 You know, within your rest time. If you're if set one you were at a three, set two you started at a four, set three you started at a five. You know, by the end of the workout you're like like at a six or seven out of ten pain, and then you're kind of feeling a little ginger the rest of the day. That might not we may have been pushing a bit too much. Second guideline in there is you shouldn't be we don't want you waking up the next day feeling extra sensitive either because sometimes we see that happen where you felt okay during during the workout you were warm and everything but, but then your body cooled down. Um, you woke up the next day and you're like, "Ooh, what the heck did I do? I would, I'm way extra sensitive than I was prior. I would be looking at the total volume of work that you did there and saying, oh, you know what? Maybe we did a bit too much. We need to scale that back too. Um, so, you know, just like kind of the, the lines on the road, give us some guidelines, like they're rules that actually give us freedom because they don't let everyone drive wherever they want to go, you know? put some lines on the road here to help guide you in the right direction so that you can get out there and take the risk of feeling some discomfort, but still know where you're going and you don't deviate too far off of the path because, you know, you put these rules in place. Yeah. Yeah. It's perfect. And again, I think that comes back to a lot of kind of self-management. Again, the longer you've been in the game, the the, the better you'll understand it. And, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm 25 and I've gone through several pretty, pretty bad injuries, but through those bad injuries, I, I always say it to my clients, it's been the greatest thing that's ever happened to me because I have had to build such an incredible self-awareness now that I can I can feel everything in myself, but then I can also then see that in other people. If those patterns are starting to recur, or if there are those imbalances, then I have become hyper aware of it because I understand it myself. So I think going through that whole kind of turning the injury into a learning process i think you can then also gather a lot of positives from it because it's like okay well i understand what's happened i understand why it's happened i understand how i come back from it and now i can put the steps in place like you said with those the the kind of lines in the road to ensure that this doesn't happen again so i think it's interesting because you always have have the opportunity to flip on its head and go okay well yeah okay yeah we screwed up here something hasn't gone quite right but yeah. now I get my chance again to kind of go back and ensure that I don't fall into those patterns with anything else. Because I think with anything injury wise, you know, there is going to be a little bit of that transferable skill, whether you're paying more attention to your warm up activation process or your prehab work 
or the you know auxiliary exercises that you're choosing as part of your programming all of these different things which again which is why it becomes so confusing to, to a lot of people there are so many different things that, that you can be thinking about but it is at the end of the day a, a learning process that you're going to kind of get more out of at the end of it you just have to it's yeah. all about perspective isn't it yeah i mean i guess to kind of wrap it up the into kind of a neat succinct summary there you know think of an injury scenario as the stress that you placed on yourself exceeded the tolerance or capacity of your body all right like you have a certain ceiling of what you can handle today you can acutely overload that system now that on the overload side, that stress could be physical. It could come from lifestyle factors. It could be the fact that you didn't sleep that well last night. Like that's where like the multitude of all these factors come in as like, why was I stressed this much? Okay. On the other, on then on the capacity side is what are all the things that I'm doing to prepare myself that like my raise my ceiling up. Right. And so whenever you get injured, the, I think the way that you sift through all kind of the BS that's out there is just to kind of fall back to this model, which is like, you know, okay, no, it's not just tight muscles. It's not just an imbalance here and there. It's not my glutes weren't firing. Like the stress on the system exceeded the capacity of the system. Now, then we can ask ourselves like, all right, capacity was here yesterday. Why wasn't it here today? Yada, yada. Stress was here. Where did it go? Yada, yada. And then the rehabilitation process then is to identify where that new tolerance is. Where is that line now currently sitting? Where is stress still currently sitting? Reestablish the balance between those two. And then the rehab process is going to be to gradually build that tolerance level back up to the point that you are now tolerating your life again. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. What a, what a wonderful way to summarise it. That's absolutely excellent. So I want to I want to wrap up really quickly with uh, with something I like to do with everyone. It's a little bit of a change of pace, but I'm very interested because I think everyone has something different to bring to the table. So I want you to take uh, a second, and I want you to imagine that you are taking a step back in in time. You're stepping into a time machine, and you get to go back to meeting your younger self, 10, 11, 12, 13, You know, a, a, an age where our lives are shaped by what what our environment is what we kind of draw attention to and you get to spend a few moments with your younger self and kind of give yourself you know whether it's a mantra to live by or a way, just something to help you out some information to get you from where you were as a child then to go through all the trials and tribulations of your life to help you create you know the fantastic business that you have now everything that you've created for yourself what wisdom what knowledge do you impart to your younger self to help you to get there um, you know, thinking back to myself 10 years ago, let's see, I was 21 and in undergrad, um, just finishing my undergrad. Yeah, I think the advice I needed at that point in my life was relax, <laughs> it's gonna be okay. Um, that was probably the advice that I needed. Um, but I would also tell myself that don't think you have to do it all on your own. Um, that, that meeting people and the peop the relationships that you make with people are going to have drastic effects on the places that you go in your life. And so spend time on building relationships because it's going to be the most valuable thing that you build in your entire life. Absolutely perfect. I love that. Thank you so much for coming up, Jacob. We'll have to have you on again because I've still got about a thousand and one different points that I want to go through with you. But you're a busy man, so we've got. This is a we have a, we have a big topic to touch on. So <laughs> I'm all, I'm down to come back whenever Sweet. you want to do awesome, it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on board, man. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a fantastic day, and I cannot wait to have you back again.